Thank you so much for joining us today, and please join me in welcoming our speaker, Erica Herschel. I'm wild today, I'll tell you. <laughs> what you don't know is that my husband and I moved house yesterday. I can find nothing. But I think today's really a terrific day to be talking about 19th century modern women. And I would just say, according to the suffrage uh, champion of the 19th century, Carrie Chapman Catt, as she put it, and I quote, getting the word male, in effect, out of the Constitution cost the women of the country 52 years of pauseless campaign. 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified and signed into law, granting women the right to vote. And if you haven't voted already, please go today. Thank you. That's my only political comment. So my interest in images of women and women artists and chase goes back a really long time. My first encounter was more years ago than I'm going to tell you. Uh, it happened when I was working on my dissertation on the Boston artist Lillian Westcott Hale, who you see here on the left and the right. On the left, and a portrait by Chase, made in about 1914, and on the right, in a self-portrait from 1928. Young Lillian Westcott was studying at the Hartford Art School in the late 1890s when Chase came there as a guest instructor. And Chase singled her out, and he wrote a letter to her mother in March 1898. And I quote from that letter, your daughter has decided talent. I would advise by all means that you help and encourage in every way you possibly can the efforts made on her part. In 1899, Westcott attended Chase's summer school at Shinnecock, and in a letter home, she related that Chase told her that he, quote, expected great things from me. Sometime after her marriage, he painted the portrait that you see on the left. And while the object she holds in her hand has most often dis been described as a fan, it also looks remarkably like a display of laden paintbrushes. And Lillian Hale became a very accomplished and successful artist in her own right. I'm showing you two of her works here, one a early one on the left called The Convalescent that belongs to the Sheldon Art Gallery at the University of Nebraska. And on the right, one I hope you'll find very familiar, Edition Deluxe from 1910 upstairs in our own galleries with a big sticker on it that says Student of William Merritt Chase. <laughs> the one on the left, I think, uh, has a foreshortened and sort of dramatic composition that she might have learned from Chase. But here, it's applied to a bedroom rather than a landscape. And I just point out that Chase's votes of confidence for Lillian Hale's work and for the work of many uh, other women artists really stuck with me and provided the germ of an idea that I was allowed to explore in the exhibition and the catalog uh, in my essay called <clears throat> Old Masters Meet New Women. One of the things that intrigued me about Chase's images of women, and I'm showing you here Chase's self-portrait from about 1884 in the exhibition, his images of women, whether they were artists or not, I find have the dignity that he lent them through his references to the old masters, and that's something that we'll look at together today. Chase was intensely proud and honored by his calling as a painter and by the artistic heritage that he embraced as the heir to a tradition that included artists like Van Dyck, Hals, Velasquez, Rembrandt, 
and the other old masters that he admired so much. And I think you'll agree that in this self-portrait, he even presents himself here as an old master with his beard, what's that beard called? A Van Dyke his upturned mustaches, the tilt of his head and the red note of his jacket, and the palette he holds reminding us very much of Velazquez's self-portrait in Las Meninas. Chase never sought to imitate the old masters, but instead to create works of art that would speak to his own age. As he said in 1903, and I quote, I saw in a new light the sublime example of Velazquez. And he added, what was so important for me was that Velazquez, with all his acquire acquirement from the masters who had gone before him, felt the need of choosing new forms and arrangements, new schemes of color and methods of painting to fit the time and place he was called on to depict. Unquote. In other words, Velazquez painted his own day and Chase adopted that himself. In his own time and place, Chase painted in a new way, becoming a modern old master and selecting new subjects, everyday modern themes, and among them, the theme of the new woman. He started really early. This is the first example I can show you, Ready for the Ride, 1877, now a new acquisition for the MFA. It's the painting that Chase described as his, quote, turning point, and it came very early in his career. It's an image of a woman that can be described both as an homage to the Netherlandish tradition and also as a vivid contemporary contemporaneous likeness. It might have its roots in a school assignment, or at least the subject was a model who was shared by other students at the Munich Academy, among them a German artist named Hugo von Habermann. And I'd like to thank my colleague in um, Munich, Susanna Bohler, for bringing von Habermann's lost painting, which you see in black and white at the center, to my attention. It's the same model in almost the same outfit. Um, the painting is lost. If anybody knows where it is, please let me know. I'm showing you at the bottom center Chase's portrait of Hugo von Habermann. The two artists were friends. The portrait uh, by Chase belongs to the Nelson Atkins Museum and was painted in about 1875. And on the right, a portrait, Cha uh, Chase portrait in the collection of the Wadsworth Athenaeum that I believe might show the same model. So all of this adds up to a model that was available at the Munich Academy. And I would also point out that despite the similarities of Chase's Ready for the Ride at left, and von Habermann's woman in a Dutch costume in black and white at center, Chase's conception is very different from von Habermann's more historicizing image. Both are very indebted to the old master tradition, and when Chase was studying in Munich in the 1870s, he became entranced with the old master paintings that he saw for the very first time at the Alta Pinacothek, which you see in the upper left in an old uh, engraved image. It looks very much the same today. And I'm showing you um, at lower left a uh, pair of Van Dyck portraits today at the Alta Pinacothek, and on the right, a beautiful, fabulous Franz Hals portrait from 1625, also in the collection of the Alta Pinacothek. Some of you might remember seeing it in my colleague Ronnie Baer's exhibition last year. Chase particularly became uh, infatuated with the work of Hals, Rembrandt, Van Dyck, and Velazquez, describing his passion for those artists as, and I quote, akin to the sensation I once had in being converted to a religion, to a raw, wrong person being converted to something right. And Chase developed a very personal relationship with the old masters. You see Chase here on the left, 
dressed for a costume ball or a tableau vivant of the sort he enjoyed throughout his life. Here, donning a rakish Dutch hat, a ruff, velvet breeches, beribboned shoes, and a long Dutch clay pipe, impersonating a wealthy 17th century Dutchman. And in Ready for the Ride, at first sight, with its three-quarter length format, its restricted palette, its austere costume, we think about numerous portraits by Rembrandt, Van Dyck, Hals, and so on, as well as more um, popular images, but old images of historic fashions, like the two I show you at bottom right. The one on the left from 1640 showing you um, the outfits of English women, and you can see the hat is very much the same as the one that appears in the chase, or on the right, the kind of masculine dress that was popular in, throughout Europe in the late 18th century. But Chase combines these references to the past with a vivid contemporaneity. And I'm demonstrating here that Chase's model is not wearing an old costume, but a contemporary riding habit dark and severely tailored in a style known as an Amazon, after the brave independent warrior horsewomen of Greek mythology. She's clearly ready for the ride, ready to embark on an outdoor adventure. And this costume would have been immediately recognizable to Chase's audience. Here's another fashion plate, this one an American one, the one I showed you just uh, this one is from a French uh, fashion magazine, La Mode Illustrée, from 1877, the same year as Chase's painting. This one a little bit later, but from Harper's Bazaar, an American um, journal. And they would have, Chase's audience would have immediately recognized this as a writing habit. Chase also was referring to well-known and popular contemporary images like these. Carolus Duras, lady with a glove, her, her gesture of, um, with her hands and the glove so similar to Chase's. This is an 1869 painting that was tremendously influential. And in 1875, just a couple years before Chase made Ready for the Ride, the Carolus Durand that you see at center was purchased by the French state for a very large sum of money. So it got a lot of publicity. Again, you can see it today at the Musée d'Orsay. Or at the upper right, another Carolus Durand, an equestrian portrait of Mademoiselle Croisette from 1873, which uh, shows his sister-in-law on Amazon, highly praised when it was shown in 1873 at the Salon in Paris, and perhaps more uh, relevant in Philadelphia in 1876. Chase sent his Ready for the Ride back to the United States to be shown in New York before the first exhibition of the Society of American Artists in 1878, right in advance of his own return for Germany, from Germany. And it was his New York debut <clears throat> before his return. And the important New York critic, Maria Grinswald Van Rensselaer, called it, and I quote, the most interesting picture of the year. A fascinating canvas, sympathetically imagined and full of an indefinable pathos. She went on to declare, it did more than anything else to introduce this young artist to his public when he shortly after followed the picture to this country. Well, one of the other things that it introduced, of course, was the idea of Chase as a painter of women. And it's the first of Chase's modern old masters to depict a new woman. Here's a woman, modern, active, ready for the ride, caught between inside and outside, about to head into action. And this is an idea that Chase continues to develop. His female subjects aren't just ready for the ride. This one's called ready for the walk. <laughs> or this one, I think I'm ready now. This, of course, is an age-old subject. 
reinvented for the modern age. Chase's model posing as a modern day Venus looking at her reflection in the mirror. The mirror, of course, the age old token of beauty and vanity. And Chase, too, delights in the gestural strokes of paint that he used to describe the supple folds of that woman's pink gown. But at the same time, he cedes control to her with his narrative title. I think I'm ready now. She is the one to decide when she's going to be ready for action. Well, Chase's women are often out and about responsive to changes in modern society that allow them more freedom in public. And this is the MFA's own park bench from around 1890, included in the exhibition. And I have to tell you that these dates for the park scenes are all over the map and not necessarily completely reliable. Uh, you can imagine that um, they all have very similar titles and it's different to figure out unless they're described completely in the press, which one is which when they were exhibited. So Chase's women are not only out and about, but very responsive to changes in modern society that allowed women more freedom in public. This so-called new woman of the late 19th century was not content to remain cocooned at home. She and her sisters were eager as the writer Gertrude Atherton explained in 1888, and I quote, to strike out for themselves and to be something more than domestic non-entities. Before the middle of the 19th century, in fact, women of a certain class and a certain level of propriety, who were, after all, the likely buyers of art, or certainly Chase's work, wouldn't have appeared in public alone like this. But in the decades after the Civil War, urban life changed substantially and women changed with it. For one thing, there were a lot more women after the Civil War. So many men had died that they kept on the more public roles, the more active um, journeys that they had taken during the war itself. And new things developed in the late 19th century that offered new spaces. Department stores, public musical and theatrical performances, particularly matinees, lectures, recitals, restaurants, museums even. This one in the Metropolitan, I would remind you, founded in 1870. And also civic parks all of them offering new spaces in which women were welcomed as connoisseurs and as consumers. This is also an identifiable place. We know where we are. And how do we know where we are? Well, it's that bench. That bench tells us that we are in New York's Central Park, designed in the mid um, 19th century by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, built out um, through the third quarter of the 19th century and known for its deliberate intention to give urban dwellers a sense of the wilderness, a sense of being outdoors and away from that dense urban environment that surrounded the park. And one of the ways it did it was with the winding paths that kept you from being able to see the city. And another way it did it was through the furniture of the park. And I'm showing you one uh, at the lower right, one of these rusticated Adirondack style log benches that were deliberately meant to uh, infuse your walk with the idea of wilderness. And you can see that Chase's woman is sitting in one of those kinds of benches. And what's she looking at? Let's see here in her lap something yellow. Well, she's not reading the dictionary. In fact, she's probably reading a novel and the fact that it's yellow probably tells us something, that it's fiction, that it's a novel. 
And in the 1840s, already in Britain, there was developed a special run of the press called the Yellowback. It was meant to compete with something that's come into new uh, attention recently with a new series on TV. Yellowbacks were meant to compete with penny dreadfuls, which were horror stories. Yellowbacks were marketed as entertaining reading, and I'm showing you one of them here. This is the New York edition of Robert Louis Stevenson's Master of Ballantrae. For those of you who are Outlander fans, the Master of Ballantrae is a story about the Jacobite Rebellion, a very romanticized uh, version indeed. And I'd also remind you that French novels are often in yellow covers as well. So she's clearly reading something entertaining. She's fashionable, to be sure. She's wearing garments that were considered appropriate for walking. And I'm showing you again here two fashion plates, Harper's on the left and Peterson's on the right, with the most up-to-date fashions for walking. I can't imagine walking in anything that had such a caboose behind it, but... Anyway, this was exactly what you should be wearing if you were taking a walk in the park, although women of the period were advised not to attract notice when they were on a public street because, and I quote, showy costumes and brilliant colors, anything more showy or brilliant than the walking dresses you see on the right, it's hard to imagine, but they were considered inappropriate. Why? too likely to solicit attention and to draw unwanted responses from men. In fact, an 1878 etiquette manual devoted a whole chapter to conduct in the street, offering advice for ladies walking or taking public transportation, while reminding and warning them of the performative nature of those activities. Let me read you this little section. A lady's conduct is never so entirely at the mercy of critics because never so public as when she is in the street. Her dress, her carriage, her walk will all be exposed to notice. Every passerby will look at her, even if it is only one glance. Every unladylike action will be marked. And in no position would a dignified, ladylike be deportment be more certain to command respect. How many of us remember not, you're not supposed to chew gum, you're not supposed to do all those things? Well, that's uh, where it came from. I think anything goes now. I wonder what they would have said about texting while walking. But I began to wonder, after reading these etiquette books, about all those blurred faces and averted eyes that we seem to see in Chase's park scenes. Are, is he presenting those women in a way that prevents us from engaging with them directly? Would it be very different if they all stared at us and looked at us straight in the eye? Would that imply that they were a different kind of woman on the street? I just want to remind you, too, that clothes like this, which seem so confining to us, didn't prevent physical activity. This is a tennis club in 1885. And yes, they all have bustles. And they are still playing tennis. So it is possible, indeed, to navigate quite physical activity uh, in an outfit like that. I also want to remind you that Chase is picking up on something that was quite popular during his day, because images of women navigating public spaces begin to appear in fine art during the 1870s. Here's one that might be more familiar to you. 1878, John Singer Sargent of the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. This woman accompanied appropriately by a gentleman. Here's Cassatt, 1880, autumn. Her sister Lydia comfortably resting on a park bench. 
It's clearly a park bench. Those green slats identify it completely. Or here's another one you might recognize of women walking in an urban place alone. Hassam uses these women and children to tame a very, very modern urban scene, giving it a sentimental cast and domesticating and feminizing what was, in fact, a very modern setting with new buildings, electric streetlights, and the trolley car traffic jam behind them. Chase's parks are groomed and cultivated. They're domestic oases, populated almost exclusively by women and children. I'm showing you three different ones here. Um, Lady Out of Doors on the left, uh, uh, from probably around 1888, a view of Chase's wife, Alice. At the upper right, a city park from the Art Institute of Chicago from around 1887. Or at the lower right, one that isn't in the exhibition called a park bench. They're all called a park bench from around 1890. Um, you can see she too is reading something and she too is reading something yellow. In a city park at the upper right, the broad promenade ends in a view of apartment buildings here. The, this is Marcy Avenue in Brooklyn, a respectable residential neighborhood in Bedford-Stuyvesant, which then was a respectable residential neighborhood and I think is probably again. Uh, it was also Chase's own neighborhood. So the setting, like Chase's model, is modern, urban, and also safe. That's a very noticeable public shift, the new ease and comfort with which an unaccompanied woman of good character could navigate the city. The freedom to travel around, as etiquette advisor Florence Howe put it, and I quote, to go about where and in whatever way we please, was praised as a distinctive hallmark of American society that differentiated it very much from Europe. So um, Florence Howe, who wrote this etiquette manual, was um, um, a Bostonian, and I'm gonna read you something that she wrote about women navigating the street in Boston. And if you're wondering who Florence Howe was, she was the daughter of someone you probably have heard of named Julia Ward Howe. She wrote, how great would the surprise of a foreigner of distinction if he should happen to catch a glimpse of the interior of a Boston horse car in the evening. If you should tell him that those groups of ladies without any attendant cavalier belong to Boston's best and that the friendly horse car would carry them safe and unmolested to their very doors, he would scarcely believe the testimony so rules of behavior and dress always needed to be, to be observed, but women had, even within them, considerable latitude. So the women that Chase depicts are not only regarded as modern women, but also in a lot of ways distinctly American. Their assertive actions, their freedom from tradition, continuously, as you know if you read Henry James, becoming entangled in the customs and conventions of European society, always running into trouble in Europe, those Henry James women, for riding their horse alone, and then of course they get malaria on the Campania because they shouldn't have been riding their horse alone. But if they were at home, they could have. Uh, that native wit and courage was something that was very much celebrated in the United States. And that distinction between Europe and America provided an additional attraction for Chase, who was a painter who was very committed to creating a modern and distinctively American art. So by showing modern women, he's also showing something distinctively American. At the same time, Chase's women aren't totally divorced from their domestic responsibility. She's clearly looking to make sure that her toddler is not gonna wander too far down that path. 
in this beautiful park scene that belongs to the Thyssen Foundation in Madrid. Yes, we tried to get it, and no, we couldn't. Um, or featuring here in Chase's Lake for miniature yachts from about 1888, included in the exhibition from a private collection, which often features children who are learning through their play all the rules about becoming an adult. But Chase's women are also very ready to come in, particularly into the studio where things unfold like a drama with lines delivered by their inquisitive titles. This one, in fact, called May I Come In. Inviting the viewer, you, to enter the conversation and breaking down the barrier between the painted scene and the spectator herself. And once inside, Chase's women occupy themselves with the life of the mind. This one uh, on the right, a very beautiful pastel in the exhibition is called Meditation. On the left, you see Chase in his 10th Street studio sitting in front of the pastel, which I've outlined for you in red. It's an image of his wife, Alice, painted, around, um, painted in pastel around 1886. As one newspaper advertiser announced in 1885, perhaps relevant to a composition entitled Meditation, and I quote, the women of today are thinking, 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 <laughs> as women did not think in olden times. So Chase's wife, Alice Chase, seen here, was one of his most frequent models. And she was the daughter of Julius Gerson, who was the New York manager of the art department for the lithographer Louis Prang, the Boston Chromolithographic Company. So Alice had been raised in an artistic household, and she very much shared her husband's aesthetic interests. Here she is perusing a folio of prints in Chase's Shinnecock studio. And I hope you all recognize the print that's on the wall behind her, something Chase very much admired, a print after the MFA's uh, Henri Regnault of Automedon with the horses of Achilles, upstairs on view in the Evans wing. Or here is Alice evaluating one of her husband's canvases. But again, Chase looks to the past for inspiration. Alice is wearing a Dutch cap and a black dress with a white lace collar and cuffs. She sits facing away, twisting around to look at us, her arm looped back over the back of the chair in a pose characteristic of multiple portraits of men by Franz Hals. And here is Hals, just an example. This is his Isaac Massa from 1626 from the Art Gallery of Ontario. Borrowing poses from art of the past had long been common practice. And contemporary painters like Sargent established a, their critical reputation, really, by giving their sitters, both men and women, uh, and also, frankly, themselves, the endorsement of the history of art, the history um, that this kind of tradition provided. But Chase takes it in an interesting direction, employing a pictorial strategy that adapted and even subverted convention because he situates women in attitudes drawn not just from historical precedents for female portraiture, but from traditions that were most often used for men. In other words, he gives strength and agency to his portraits of women by basing them on male prototypes. Well, this was nervous making. That kind of connoisseurship was something that was shown in the latest fashion magazines. On the left, you see an illustration from Moniteur de la Mode, that great French magazine, showing two women in the most fashionable outfits, uh, looking at prints and paintings in an artist's studio. But who knew where that was going to lead? It would lead clearly to the upset of the entire household. 
as you can see in this anti-suffrage image on the right, where the poor man is faced with doing all the household chores of cooking and doing the laundry while his wife sits with the newspaper, in this case an issue of a magazine called Truth, which couldn't help but recall one of the key proponents of women's rights, a woman named Sojourner Truth, who gave a great speech earlier in the 19th century called Ain't I a Woman? But there are reassuring things too. The painting that Chase's wife is looking at is one of his paintings called A Fairy Tale from 1892 in a private collection. You see it now on the right, and yes, we tried to get that one too and failed. So what you have on the left in Chase's An Artist's Wife, which is in the exhibition, a double portrait. Because Alice is looking at a painting of herself. And you see that painting on the right. She's sitting with her young daughter, Koto Chase, in the grassy dunes at Shinnecock in the painting called Fairy Tale. And in this way, Alice is simultaneously shown in the diverse roles that related to her own life and to that contemporary dialogue about woman's proper place. She's both inside and outside. She's passive and active. She's a connoisseur and a mother. And if you think I'm just whistling Dixie by pairing these two things, I would point out that Chase took these two paintings and showed them together at the Society of American Artists in the spring of 1893, and they were discussed and illustrated together in the press. It might not surprise you to know that many women who believed in being modern and in being active and perhaps espousing women's rights also anxiously sought to reassure the public that their quest for equal opportunity did not threaten home and hearth. I'm showing you here two photographs of one of the leading suffragists of the late 19th, early 20th century. This is Inez Milholland, leading at lower right a suffrage parade in 1913. Even militant suffragists like Inez Milholland, who attended Vassar College and was suspended at Vassar for organizing a women's rights meeting, <laughs> she became a suffragist, a labor lawyer, a World War I correspondent, and a public speaker who greatly influenced the women's movement in America. And I would just remind you of the theme of Henry James's novel, The Bostonians, which also very much features active women speaking in public. Um, Inez Mulholland was a key suffragist, and you see her on horseback here at Lower Right, leading one of the many suffrage parades in New York. But in the press, she sometimes wanted to reassure uh, the public that everything wasn't going to turn upside down, that the husbands weren't going to have to only do the laundry. And the illustration that I'm showing you at the upper left is from Good Housekeeping magazine in 1912, and the article is called The Feminine Charms of the Woman Militant. And every one of the suffragists is featured, and it says how they can bake cookies, and they're really good mothers. And this is Inez Mulholland posing as the classical figure Cornelia, who, when asked to turn over all of her jewels, looked at her children and said, these are my jewels. So women's new roles and activities don't preclude traditional ones, despite the kind of rhetoric in the popular press that implied otherwise, augmented with those threatening images of house uh, husbands henpecked, forced to do laundry, or worse, of women dressed in men's attire. 
Some of Chase's most beautiful works show women in maternal roles, caring for or supervising their children, as in For the Little One on the left-hand screen from about 1896, showing Alice Chase sewing a long white garment, perhaps for her fifth daughter, Helen, who was born just before the painting was made. Or on the right-hand side, Alice again looking after her daughters uh, and um, uh, other, they also had two sons here on the beach and dunes at Shinnecock. While Alice didn't just pose, she also made photographs. She was very active as a photographer and she made a lot of these blue cyanotypes which document that Chase lived very happily in a world of women. Here's Chase, here are his kids. Two boys, six girls. He was a loving husband to Alice, the father of six daughters, and the aspiring, inspiring teacher of numerous women art students. And he also made his name by picturing women in many different roles, active, meditative, urban, in the country, professional, and domestic. And the particular support that he offered his female art students, many of whom later had distinguished careers, was notable. Genius has no sex, Chase said. In my own classes, I teach both sexes alike. So here is Chase painting Dora Wheeler in 1882-83, a painting now in the Cleveland Museum, one of the masterpieces there. Dora Wheeler was a former student, and Chase shows her in her own studio, emphasizing her status as a professional colleague. She sits in front of an Asian-inspired textile backdrop it could actually be a Chinese fabric or something in a Chinese style from Associated American Artists, one of the leading design firms in New York, which was owned and operated by Dora Wheeler's mother, Candace Wheeler. And the blue ceramic pot that you see next to her, both the textile design and the pot, refer to Dora Wheeler's own work as a designer for Associated Artists. But at this point in her career, Wheeler was also seeking to establish herself as a painter, and she had studied at the Académie Julien in Paris in addition to studying with Chase. I just add that while a lot of scholars today, myself included, associate this portrait with Chase's admiration for James McNeil Whistler, in its own day, this portrait also evoked the old masters, and Chase once again was proposed as their modern interpreter. William Brownell, writing in the Magazine of Art, for example, declared that Chase had presented a, quote, capital demonstration of Franz Hals's rendering of flesh, adding that, and I quote again, if one cannot be Franz Hals, you can nevertheless, if he be as clever and sympathetic as Mr. Chase is, show very plainly the success with which Hals's manner and method may be studied and applied to one's own purposes. Thus again, we see the old masters providing an armature on which Chase built something new, along with giving you that sense of his own artistic heritage, adding luster and status to his images of women. I just want to show you a couple of Dora Wheeler's own works because you hardly ever get to see them. And I'm sorry, the image on the right is a little bit blurry. On the left is her fairy in irises from about 1888 from the Metropolitan Museum's collection. It's a watercolor. Dora Wheeler was a, um, particularly known for her designs of Christmas cards and the like. I think you can see this is in a very illustratory mood. On the right, her oil portrait of her cousin with his dog, now in the collection of the High Museum in Atlanta. Chase apparently understood this dichotomy that women of his day, and ourselves as well, frankly, still face. Sometimes one portrait doesn't say it all. And in 1888, Chase produced two portraits of one student. Both of these paintings 
the one on the left in the Metropolitan Museum, the one on the right in the exhibition and borrowed from uh, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum. Both of these paintings show Marriott Cotton, one in pink, one in black, in each capturing a different strand, perhaps, of his sitter's character, reflecting maybe the antithetical choices that she faced. Enveloped in pink tulle, as on the right, she seems quiet and thoughtful, the modest debutante contemplating a traditional life. Garbed in black on the left, confronting the viewer directly, her hand on her hip, she is the epitome of the determined professional. Chase showed these two paintings, both painted in 1888, together in New York and in St. Louis, showing the duality of his sitter's position. Muncie's magazine, in an article about Mariette Cotton, who, by the way, was nicknamed Pansy, wrote about pa Pansy Cotton's own self-portrait that I think gets at this dichotomy fairly well. The writer said that in that portrait, Pansy Cotton seemed to, quote, come out of the frame with outstretched hand to greet you. She looked too much the woman of fashion to be the hardworking artist. As a matter of fact, Miss Cotton is both. I wish I could find that self-portrait. It's gone missing. Once again, if you know where it is, <laughs> let me know. But I do want to show you two works by Marriott Cotton, both of these much later. On the right, her portent of Brayton Eve from 1907. He was the president of the Northern Pacific Railroad and the New York City Stock Exchange for a short time. This is the kind of professional male portrait that was uh, an unusual commission for a woman artist to get. Most often women artists were commissioned to do portraits of the wives and children, but not necessarily the official portraits of men. Uh, it was shown in Paris in 1907 and won an honorable mention there. And on the right, a much later one by Mariette Cotton of uh, a nurse during the First World War. Both of these on the auction market. I don't know where they ended up. And here's another Chase student, Lydia Field Emmett. It's a striking portrait. And those pink ribbons down her back, which you could wear either on your hat or on the back of your dress, were called Follow Me Lad Streamers. And Chase's portrait was praised in the New York Times when it was shown at the annual exhibition of the Society of American Artists in 1892. Well, Lydia Field Emmett, who you see here, was one of a clan of women artists who, whom Henry James referred to as the intertwingles. Let's not go there. This is Lydia. And her sisters, also on the left, Rosina Emmett Sherwood, whose elegant woman near a lake, a watercolor that was recently on the market, you see on the left, and Jane Emmett de Glenn, whose Linda's Garden, another painting from the auction market, you see on the right. So there was Lydia Emmett, Rosina Emmett Sherwood, Jane Emmett de Glenn, and a fourth one I don't have a slide of, their cousin Ellen Emmett Rand. So lots of Emmett's. You might know Jane from this portrait by Sargent, The Fountain, from 1907. That's Jane Emmett painting next to her lazy husband, Wilfred <laughs> de Glenn. Lydia Field Emmett studied at the Academy Julienne in Paris and with Chase at the Art Students League and also in Shinnecock. Just the year that Chase painted her, she was commissioned to do a mural for the women's building at the Chicago World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, in, uh, which you see here at Upper Left, that large building designed by a woman architect and filled with works of art and other things, all by women. And on the right, you see um, Lydia Field Emmett's mural, which was called Art, Literature, and the Imagination. And I just want you to keep in mind that the imagination is represented by a college graduate. Hold that thought. 
And Emmett also uh, made easel paintings, her self-portrait on the left, which she gave to the National Academy of Design when she was elected to full membership there in 1912, or on the right, a somewhat earlier portrait of two brothers, uh, uh, 1909, in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum, again, fulfilling my uh, conclusion that women portraitists most often do portraits of children or other women. But at the same time that Chase's portrait of Lydia Field Emmett was on view at the Society of American Artists, Emmett was showing her own work a dozen blocks away at the National Academy of Design. Her painting also received notice in the Times, and the simultaneity of those two New York displays, to my mind, demonstrates that Emmett was not just the object of a male painter's gaze, but also a keen player in the art world herself. And I can't help but wondering whether she colluded with Chase, who, by the way, served on the National Academy jury that year, to have paintings that are about Lydia Emmett one way or another in both locations. Those follow me lad streamers that connote flirtation and enticement, I think, think lead straight to a woman of initiative and action. Let's look now at the Chase portrait of Lydia. Her black gown is festooned with white lace at the neck and sleeves. Uh, with that dramatic pink bow, with that great slash of pink paint running down her back. It's a sort of Van Dykian fashion, as you can see, that black and white with the lace that was very popular, again, in the late 19th century. And we might characterize the whole thing as Van Dykian, because, of course, Lydia looks as regal as Lord Bernard Stuart, the cavalier son of the Duke of Lennox, captured in just the same pose with his hand on his hip in Van Dyke's 1630s portrait, which you see on the right, which was um, displayed in London in the 1880s and much discussed, illustrated, copied, and recommended in guidebooks. Or maybe Lydia's aspect comes from Franz Hals, who frequently uses that same pose twice in this Officers and Sergeants of the St. George Civic Guard, 1639, from the Hals Museum in Harlem. Uh, Hals's likeness of Peter Schaup, the proud standard bearer that you see here at the far right, was particularly famous, and Chase had made a copy of it when he was in Harlem in 1883. Or maybe it recalls Hals's figure of Johann Schotter, the brewer with the magnificent blue sash at the center of this group portrait, the Cavalierman Civic Guard, also in the Hals Museum. Um, by Hals. And again, we know it's a portrait that Chase particularly admired because some years later, when he went to the Hals Museum again in 1903, Chase painted himself, which you see on the left in the guise of Colonel Van Lu, just to the left here of um, in the Hals group military portrait. So in this way, Chase is reminding himself of the achievements of his predecessors and actually reenacting them, transforming himself into an old master, not only in his own eyes, but in the eyes of his students. Well, what about all these ladies with their hands on their hips? Lydia on the left again, the portrait of Miss L, uh, Miss Lawrence, another uh, portrait that's included in the exhibition, also shown at the World's Columbian in the 1890s, or on the right, the lady in black showing Mariette Cotton. Well, we can talk about Emmett's pose recalling the old masters and radiating all the confidence that a successful artist would require, gaining in rank and status by this association with these male prototypes. But there's another part to the story because the strength of these works comes not only from the past, but also from the present. That one arm on your hip 
is a pose associated particularly in popular culture with the new woman of the 1890s. That assertive, active, independent, um, bicycle riding, scholarly woman, uh, the new woman of the 1890s. And I just remind you of the three illustrations that are on your handout. The one at the top of a lady bicyclist, one of many where they're shown leading against their stallions, if you might put it that way, which allowed women incredible movement that they'd never enjoyed before. And note the bloomers or in the May Scribner's uh, issue that was about Wellesley College. Here are all of these studious women, not only with books, but also with bicycles. Or here on the right in a uh, magazine illustration called The New Wim Woman. See what happens when women get books? It's really dangerous. And what happens is somebody like Charles Dana Gibson makes fun of it in a wonderful cartoon that I absolutely adore from 1903, Collier's Weekly Magazine. It's called The Weaker Sex. <laughs> this is a man. <laughs> Gibson, of course, one of the era's best known illustrators. Uh, who first sold his illustrations to Life magazine in 1886, so very much contemporary with Chase. And um, just a few years later, he'd become one of the most sought after illustrators in the US. And he created for us this whole image of the new woman, the ideal American woman, handsome, tall, healthy, full of an independent spirit and self-confidence. And you can see in this one in particular a very playful attitude towards the shift that was very much taking place in women's roles in society during this period. And look what appears in this foreground of this image, that other symbol of liberated womanhood, the bicycle. And this, what is this? This is William Merritt Chase teaching at Shinnecock in the late 1890s. As one writer put it, Chase's successful school at Shinnecock, and I quote, blossomed every summer with feminine talent. Well, not only feminine talent in the form of the art students who took classes there, like Lillian Hale and many of the others we've looked at, the school itself was a female enterprise devised by the woman you see on the left, whose name was Janet Hoyt, a forward-looking woman and an entrepreneur described in 1890 New York Herald as the inventor of Southampton. Uh, you see various views of Southampton in um, an 1872 article, sorry, 1892 article from Frank Leslie's Weekly. Hoyt solicited Chase to teach at Shinnecock and she secured the school's funding through a group of not men, but women. Among them, Mrs. Astor, Mrs. Belmont, Mrs. Carnegie, Mrs. Vanderbilt, and Mrs. Whitney, New York's preeminent women benefactors. So the whole school was conceived by a woman, funded by woman, women, and very much populated by women. Well, to my mind, one of Chase's most characteristic successes as a teacher is the fact that only some of his students followed his stylistic example, and others used his classes as a springboard for their own artistic innovations. On the left, you see the work of the Vermont-born painter Hilda Belcher, who studied in New York with Chase, and she made this watercolor, which is called the Checkered Dress in 1907, it belongs to Vassar, of one of her fellow women art students in Chase's classes. And that fellow art student who wore that checkered dress painted the still life with copper pot that you see on the right-hand screen. She liked still life painting, it turns out. Her name was Georgia O'Keeffe. As Chase put it, I believe I am the father of more art children than any other teacher. And as O'Keeffe said of Chase, 
There was something fresh and energetic and fierce and exciting about him that made him fun. So Chase was a maker of artists as well as a maker of art. And all of the works that you now see on the screen, and I could have shown you many, many more, are works by women artists who had successful careers who studied with Chase. And I'd point out especially Rosalie Gill at the upper right, because that's Chase's studio painted by Rosalie Gill. And not only did he support women as art students, he bought their work. And not just his student work, one might argue that maybe they were gifts or maybe they were cheap. Chase also owned all of these things. Eva Gonzalez's Girl with Cherries from 1870 at the upper left and um, Bert Morisot's Woman at Her Toilette from 1875, both of these paintings at the top, owned by Chase and now both in the Art Institute of Chicago. At the lower center, Mariah Oki Dewing, Still Life of Carnations, now in a private collection. So he very actively bought work by women artists. He integrated his family life and his art, living happily in that feminine world of daughters that became part of his art. And I think when we look at William Barrett Chase from the very beginning of his career to the very end, marked by these two self-portraits, you can see his embrace of the modern in his art, including very much his interest in supporting and portraying modern women. Thank you. I left time for questions. If anybody has any, I'll be more than delighted to take them. And if you need to go vote, you just go do that. And if you need to beat the cafeteria line, I understand that too, and you're welcome to do that as well. But if you do have questions, I'll be happy to take them. Can you talk to us a little bit about the painting in pastel part? Is it the same kind of pastels that we think of today? And what attracted him to it? How did he use the medium to get the kinds of effects that we think of traditionally as oil effects? Okay. Um, a complicated question about pastel, which I will attempt to answer, but I would also use it as an opportunity to advertise for a uh, lecture that will take place here on November 20th. Marjorie Shelley, who is the head of the paper conservation studio at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and an expert in pastel, is coming to talk to us on Sunday the 20th at 2 o'clock about Chase and pastel. So um, take what I say with a grain of salt because Marjorie knows it much better than I do. Um, pastel was a, a medium that was very popular in the 18th century. It was considered feminine. I didn't roll that into my lecture today, but I uh, actually could have, now that I think about it. Um, it was always called painting in pastel, which sort of elevated it out of drawing and turning it into something that was considered a finished work of art. And those of you who are familiar with certainly French pastels of the 18th century know how finished they are. And they were shown and is exhibited as finished works of art. And it's just traditionally always called painting in pastel. The method goes out of favor um, as a fine art technique. It, um, people still do it. Women still do it. But in the late 19th century, it was revived. And in New York, it was revived by Chase and his colleagues who founded a group called the Society of Painters in Pastel. And that's what this double PP stamp means in a couple of the pastels, including this one, where it looks very much like a Japanese colophon or pr uh, print stamp. Um, so it's the Society of Painters in Pastel. And the answer is yes, it is very much like today's pastels. It was a, a, a medium that was admired very much by modern artists for the brilliancy of its color, for the way that it could show the artist's hand, 
And when I say that, I want you to think not only of Chase in the uh, image on the left, but also Cassatt and Dicka, who used pastel frequently, and it's much more gestural and loose and open in their work. Um, so it was very popular with artists who espoused the Impressionist style. Chase uses it both ways. Some of them are graphic looking, that seem more, if I can put it this way, scribbly looking. And some of them are so highly finished in the style of the 18th century that you're hard pressed from a distance to tell whether they're oil uh, paintings or pastels. And there are a couple of examples of both of them in, in the exhibition. It's very hard to tell the difference sometimes. Why he did some, some one way and some the other, I can't tell you, but I'm hoping Marjorie can. <laughs> Any other questions? Next question in the back here. Um, I was recently in Dublin, and I saw a painting uh, by Rosa Bonheur of a stag, and next to the painting was a paragraph that explained, as dresses were so confining, she applied to the police to get a permit to wear pants or trousers. Yes. And so literally it was illegal for a woman to not wear a dress? Um, in Paris, there, it, it was not considered proper for a woman n to dress in men's clothing. Um, and I know that Bonheur got a permit to dress as a man, and the other person who got a permit to dress in men's clothing was a f fabulously interesting woman named Elizabeth Gardner, who came from New Hampshire and ended up um, having quite a career as an academic painter in Paris, just as Bonheur did. She ended up marrying William Bouguereau, um, who was the great French academic master. So um, there was a thing where you couldn't appear on the streets of Paris in public um, as a woman wearing men's clothes. You had to get a special permit. They had lots of rules in France. If anybody's ever lived there, you know that. Um, but I haven't traced the, the history of uh, when I hope that rule got overturned. <laughs> Eric, are you? Thank you for a great lecture. Um, was there an intellectual conversation uh, among or between artists in the United States who were painting at that time in that style and, and those in Europe, for example, particularly in Paris or in Amsterdam? Um, it depends what you mean by an intellectual conversation. I would say that Chase certainly was completely well connected with artists in Europe. He was a friend, for example, um, well, a friend for a while with Whistler until they um, came to a parting of the ways. But he was also friends with contemporary artists in Holland and um, in Paris. He knew Alfred Stevens, for example. He knew Cassatt. So inevitably, of course, he was having conversations uh, about style with those artists. He also was very um, uh, careful throughout his career to send works to Europe for exhibition and commentary and paying attention to the results um, from the international press. So he was very, very connected uh, and very much a cosmopolitan figure. The um, picture that's on the cover of the Chase exhibition catalog, not my little book, but the, the one that opens the exhibition, the girl in red, today called a young orphan. She's wearing black against a red background. Was shown for the first time in Brussels at a symbolist exhibition where it was very highly admired by the leading avant-garde Belgian symbolists. So yes, to answer your question. Over here. And then I think there's a lady in green in the middle who also has a question. But let's start with you. Did Chase have an opinion about women in life drawing classes and in uh, life drawing classes uh, for men and women at the same time. I know that he followed Aiken at the Pennsylvania Academy um, um, on faculty. It's but. a very complicated question about life drawing and it's sometimes also hard to find out. Um, but Chase didn't teach drawing, Chase taught painting. So his students in those very rigorous um, academic style, traditional 
um, programs would have already had life drawing before they got to Chase. Aikens, of course, the great example for those who don't know, was a, was a vociferous proponent of life drawing for both men and women to the point where he had many of his students participate in dissections for anatomy lessons and also for, uh, was uh, renowned for having removed the loincloth from a male model in a um, um, women's life drawing class, which finally was the final straw of a lot of things that got him fired from the, Pen the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts School and Chase did succeed him. It's, um, so, so it's a complicated question because Chase didn't teach life drawing. Uh, not to my knowledge, but I will freely admit that I haven't read every single article that has survived of Chase's lessons to his art students. So the question is about Chase's children and what became of them and if any of them became artists. Um, several of them admired art a great deal, including um, uh, Cozy, who, who particularly admired Japanese art, but none of them became artists. And they all got married and had happy lives, and many, many, many of uh, his descendants came to our opening party. I know Chase's granddaughter in particular, who's named Robin Chase, and who's been a great champion of her grandfather's work uh, over the years. But they, they did not become artists themselves. They, you know, an artist's life is a hard life. Um, both economically and otherwise. So maybe they saw too much. <laughs> yes, in the back. Was there something in Chase's upbringing that led to his recognition and encouragement? OK, the question is, um, was there something in Chase's background that led to his encouragement of women? And the answer is we don't know. Um, Chase grew up in Indiana, uh, in, a in a couple of small towns in south central Indiana, and then his family eventually moves to St. Louis. Um, his father was a shoe salesman. Um, there's not a lot of artistic background in his family. In general, I would say, in looking over the, the history, for example, of women's suffrage, that the further west you go, the more support there is for women's rights. Uh, some of the first states to allow women to vote were all in the west. The further west you go, the more liberal they are in one way or another, and it's um, a lot of the western states had already granted suffrage be well before 1920. So I don't know if St. Louis was far enough west for it to be a little bit more generally uh, supportive or not. Maybe there's somebody from St. Louis in the audience who knows. I don't, but that's a really good question. No St. Louis people here, huh? Great. Anybody else? Thank you so much, Erica. Okay, thank, thank you. So much you. For today.